welcome to our panel where we will be discussing who leads innovation, banking as a service or customer facing fintechs. And over the last couple of years, and especially in the last few months, uh, global pandemics withstanding, banking as a service companies have gained a larger footprint in the fintech world. And obviously with the introduction of PSD2 and open banking regulations in Europe, there is now the freedom for this innovative API driven era to thrive and it's opened up opportunities for countless new players. Now, on the other hand, banking as a service is now not limited to fintechs only. They're now working with bricks and mortar financial institutions too. Now, on top of the digital banks, various lending platforms and digital wallets, how can we mitigate this over-dependency on uh, financial software companies? So, in this relationship, which side dictates the trends? Which side has more power? Now, uh, for this panel, we have some brilliant speakers that are right at the forefront of this changing ecosystem. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves very briefly. And um, so firstly, I'm going to turn it over to the team who are over in Lithuania to start. Uh, Andres, could you kick us off first? Please? Yeah. Could you hear me? So I'm Andres Bogdanovich. Uh, I have a few interesting roles in Mambu. Uh, so first of all, I am heading Lithuanian Technology Center and uh, also I am having a very interesting challenge leading a global team of platform and uh, service reliability in Mambo. Absolutely brilliant. And Erika, please. Uh, so hi there. Thank you for having me. I'm Erika Maslowskaita, Chief Business Development Officer at Inventi. We're the software development provider uh, and SaaS product company for the fintech companies and payment providers uh, based here in Lithuania and uh, part in, part in partnering with the companies from Central Europe and, uh, and Baltics. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. And Andy, could I have you please? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, fantastic to be joining you, albeit virtually today. Um, my name's Andy Patton. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Contis. Um, my background prior to joining Contis was that I've worked at American Express, um, MasterCard, and also for a uh, startup uh, accelerator based in, in, in Zurich. Um, in terms of the, the role at Contis, I lead our sales team, um, our account development team, uh, Lithuanian office in Vilnius, um, marketing and also client solutions. And uh, um, Contis itself is an award-winning uh, banking in a box or banking as a service provider and um, works with some fantastic partners, uh, including Paysera in, uh, in, over in Vilnius. Uh, brilliant. So, and lastly, Benjamin. Hello, and uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you all as well. I am Benjamin Ensor. I'm Director of Research at 11FS. We are a consultancy. We believe that uh, digital financial services is only 1% finished, and we're working with our clients to change the fabric of financial services by building the remaining 99%. Absolutely excellent. And uh, yeah, Andy, as you said, uh, we're obviously the three of us are, are joining digitally. Um, it's the first time I've worn a suit in about two months. So uh, it's slightly <laughs> strange. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I really, I think the best way to, to start this panel is um, to kind of look at the the kind of preamble, how it started. So if I could, Benjamin, could I direct this question as, uh, towards you? you know, how has the pandemic and the fact that we've had an ever increasing amount of digital technology um, and a digital world, how's that contributed to the growth of the banking as a service industry? The pandemic has obviously been a human disaster in, in so many ways. Um, but if you're looking for a silver lining in the cloud, one of those silver linings has been how resilient digital technology has been and how much the industry, not only the financial services industry, but also many other industries, have hugely accelerated in terms of adoption of digital. You know, we've seen so many companies that were skeptical about people working from home suddenly realizing, oh, wow, it works. The technology works. It can be done. So you've seen a couple of things happen. Firstly, you've got executives who've been talking about digital suddenly being paid attention to. People who've been banging the drum for digital for years, suddenly the stuck in the muds are really listening to them. Then, of course, you've got pressure on established companies, companies realizing, wow, 
we really need to think differently about our operations. We need to think about how we can cut costs, find faster, better ways of doing things. And that is creating a huge appetite to look at things in new ways and look at partnering with other companies, among other things, to build better, faster, cheaper services. And that's driving uh, renewed or increased interest in banking as a service propositions. Interesting. And uh, Andy, if I could also get your input on that, you know, do you think, uh, do you agree? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think Benjamin's uh, uh, hit, hit a lot of the high notes there. Um, I think there's just been some really amazing um, transformations recently. I, I read a stat the other day that um, the average Briton has been cashless for the last 44 days, uh, which, which when you think about, um, you know, the, the structure of the economy, um, I, I think that that is, is incredible. We know that there's been more e-commerce. That's been up 168%, no surprise there. But in terms of, of actual that, that extent of, of, of change, I think that's, that, that's really been, uh, you know, quite remarkable. I think that certain sectors um, will really see a, a lot of focus. We're thinking about some of those uh, care-related sectors, um, supporting uh, the vulnerable um, and those elements of society um, where there may be shielding. But I think it goes beyond that. I think that it will go into areas of the economy where they're looking at um, the ageing population um, and those sorts of people that require that service. And I think that actually the, um, the pandemic will act as, a, um, um, as an expediter of uh, a lot of that focus. Definitely, I can imagine. And I mean, this has been a challenge for a lot of, you know, of, of companies across numerous verticals, um, retail especially, but it looks like financial services might have come out relatively unscathed. Um, Andreas, could I ask you, typically before the pandemic, what were some of the main challenges that financial software companies were facing? And uh, you know, do you think the pandemic has changed that at all? Yeah, so probably, <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, it's it's really interesting perspective, you know, when the pandemic starts, uh, and I am very much relating to what uh, uh, colleague Benjamin has said, uh, is I am now typically asking a question, various executive, guys, who are leading the digital transformation in your organization? Uh, is it CAO? Is it CTO? And you know, the most common answer which I get nowadays is COVID-19. So actually, uh, what everybody has been planning uh, many times uh, uh, before, before the pandemic, the pandemic was like uh, um, a facilitator of all of those plans to be happen. Because, you know, if we think like a human beings, you know, our needs haven't changed. They haven't drifted away. It's, uh, and the services which we need to support our cure human needs uh, are still the same. It's maybe the channels and the way uh, is transforming now, and uh, as uh, some people have say, it's probably might stay or be a new normal. Interesting. And Eric, yeah. could I also get your input on that? Yeah, indeed, actually, you know, I was referring to the meme that transferred, the uh, shifted over the internet, you know, in terms of the who, who lead the who led the digital transformation, and of course, COVID-19. And uh, for us as uh, business stakeholders and executives, it's a really crucial part to take a lead and actually enable our, our partners and clients and end-to-end -end customer to find the way how to use this uh, financial disruption uh, to get whether the financial uh, financial uh, support that they need in these like challenging times right so uh, for the fintechs of course the the way of working since the fintechs were always filling a gap for alternative payments for better customer experience for better ui for tracking and anal anal analyzing the data right how do you use what is your consumption of the uh, things that you are buying online so now it's shifted rapidly and for us i think uh, in the supporting the fintech industry it's a really challenging thing to uh, onboard the customer at the moment since again like the user base we 
in most of the cases fintechs were were targeting the youngsters so to say the younger audience these days when everyone is like trying to secure the social social distancing many elderly people are in need of getting uh, getting their uh, their purchases done so of course for the banks and for the fintech companies there is a need to to reach to those kind of customers and of course uh, tech uh, uh, tech engineering part which was as we know banks like big corporate organizations and they're struggling to being fast and effective right so for now there is no time actually you know to to find like the key stakeholder the key vendor to to shift their business really rapidly and they need the trust uh, trustful partners tech partners to enable that digital uh, digital presence uh, really fast in in terms of their business Interesting. And Erica, if I could actually follow up from that, do you think that this is going to, obviously we've just talked about how it's had a, a cultural shift and a, certainly a technological shift as people are more accepting of digital. And do you think this is going to change regulatory um, culture when it comes to maybe uh, changing KYC or anything like that? Uh, I am more than sure, basically, like from the news that uh, that our now evolving and uh, now being on top of the of the new section so we see that most of the regu regulatory uh, institutions they're trying to find ways how to en enable governments just to launch let's say the open banking uh, s solutions present in the countries and at least 50 percent of the g20 countries are uh, are willing to enable open banking this year already so i think that's a huge shift for the regulation in general and uh, in venti we're supporting the fintechs uh, here uh, in lithuania who are trying to obtain the specialized bank license or the emis license with the central bank of lithuania uh, so we see the huge demand that they're trying to speed up the process for getting the license and these software as a service products products uh, might enable uh, the better and the faster shift uh, for their business. Interesting. Oh, brilliant. And um, yeah, I've got to ask, actually, you know, now that we're having this, um, you know, everyone's kind of segmented in their own homes and, and it's, it's kind of hard to build up those kind of uh, friendships or partnerships and collaborations, um, which has become such a recent trend in this industry. Uh, Andy, could I get your viewpoint on this? Because uh, I think your insight would be really interesting. You know, how, what, what new collaborations and partnerships will be formed and how will they be formed in the light of this you know, upcoming economic crisis? Sure. Um, I think that um, partnerships can be difficult. They, um, there, there was some research recently put out by uh, EFMA and, uh, and, and Capgemini whereby they said that 50% uh, of fintechs didn't necessarily feel that they were in, in the right partnership. And I think that part of that is around the different cultures that exist, maybe between a large company and a small company, uh, differing focuses on agility um, and different focuses on maybe uh, reputation and, um, and, and, and regulatory aspects, for, as an example. But I think what's happening at the moment and, and what will, will really come out of, uh, of the pandemic is that the, the absolute sort of necessity for some of those innovations and for some of those partnerships to succeed and also the impetus for speed. Um, for example, at Contis, we, we developed um, a, a, alongside Visa a, a solution which was uh, targeted at the National Health Service in the UK, being able to give um, uh, carers who were, were buying products on behalf of those people who were shielding the vulnerable um, uh, to be able to do that safely. And I think that um, the sort of... Uh, partnerships that we'll see, I alluded to it a little bit earlier on, will be around uh, definitely that carer um, offering. I think that there'll be um, some, some really great um, examples of, of partnerships around that, and we're already seeing some ourselves as, as Contis. And I think also um, partnerships around liquidity, lending platforms, um, getting money into the hands of those businesses who are maybe coming out of um, furlough processes or processes maybe where government, central or local, have supported them. So I think they're two key areas that will really, will really see a lot of, of partnership-orientated activity. And I think that 
because of the pandemic that actually the impetus to make a success of those partnerships will be um, e even stronger. Excellent. And uh, Andres, yeah, as, as Mambu, uh, I really like you, your input when it comes to uh, collaborating. Uh, can you can you give me a bit more input on that as well in terms of how are these new kind of collaborations going to, to exist in this post-corona world? Yeah, sure. Uh, I very much agree with what Andy has uh, said on the topic. In our business is actually where we are uh, really trying to help traditional banking to uh, to, to be successful in digitize, digitalizing their offerings, we actually see a lot of potential. First of all, uh, we see that traditional banks, they are built to last, not to change. Therefore, they are very much facing the challenge with the speed, the speed of change, the speed of provisioning new infrastructures, the speed of uh, handling their vendors so they can, uh, so they can implement some new functionalities for their customers. Uh, and the second, what is very important, they are looking for the flexibilities, uh, especially in this uh, pandemic situation where they need to uh, start transforming their offerings to a fully digital uh, space. And uh, those flexibilities, those are incapability to be very flexible, to, to utilize the capabilities of the ecosystem or choose a best-in-class uh, solution uh, which is provided in the ecosystem and integrated to the existing infrastructure. This is where actually banking as a service solution like Mambo uh, chip in, chips in very well. So if you think that, uh, you know, in the traditional banking, in order to implement uh, some of the changes, deliver some new functionality, it usually takes months. So in banking as a service, uh, some functionalities can be delivered in weeks or sometimes even days. Really interesting, excellent. And so, I mean, kind of following on to that, that new development of, of, um, of tech, I mean, and new products, and when it comes to this new development, do you think it's been supply or demand driven? Uh, Benjamin, could I, could I get your input on that, please? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, in a sense, it's both because what really drives innovation is companies looking for new ways to create value for their customers. And so you have the companies, the, the brands, if you like, that, are, that own the customers or have the customer relationships looking for new things that they can do. And then they're looking for partners who can enable things, who can help them do things faster. At the same time, you've got the capability providers, the, the software providers and so on developing new, better ways of doing things. So in a sense, it's both the demand side and the supply side. Um, it's when they come together that the magic really happens, because often innovation is, um, comes from the combination of existing capabilities, combining two things into one. So it's a bit hard to say it's one or the other, because it's really, it's actually both. It's the, it's the collaboration that creates the innovation often. Interesting. And speaking of that collaboration, um, Erica, I know uh, you know, speaking because obviously uh, Lithuania, I know Inventi um, actually helped Revolut gain their banking license um, over there. And I was wondering how much power do you know, customer facing fintechs like Re Revolut um, have over the, the creation of this new product, uh, product capabilities? So, yeah, we're, thank you for the question. You know, over a year now we are collaborating with the Revolut Bank so we uh, successfully implement, implemented the regulatory connector uh, for them so that they would comply with the specialized bank license uh, just uh, you know implemented the integration with the tax authority organization and uh, the main thing and the main uh, goal of, of theirs, why they chose the local vendor to implement the solution. So first thing we had, they defined software as a service product, which has the, the streamlined functionality and the deliver, uh, the time to market, the delivery uh, time that they actually needed to, to, comply, in with, to comply with the regulation and um, with different stakeholders that were involved. So we're really happy having Revolut on board for us as a small company, uh, locally based here. Uh, it's a really 
big trust from uh, from the unicorn, fintech unicorn, who is actually shifting and disrupting the finance industry uh, whatsoever. So also I can mention out of the partnerships since we've uh, mentioned those. So uh, we, would, we, would, we are really happy to work with Mambu as well and with the Mambu customers. So we were helping them also to, to uh, enable the regulatory connectors uh, if they're having and considering Mambu as a core banking platform. Okay. And uh, Andy, I've also got to ask you, yeah, how much power do you think um, the customer facing fintechs actually have? Um, you know, or, or do you think it is actually driven um, uh, from the um, banking as a service companies? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a mix of both. Um, mm -hmm. When we when we think about the uh, the, the client facing um, fintech, they they. Um, maniacally focused on solving a problem. They've, they've got a very clear view of what that problem is that they're trying to solve. Um, they're obviously, you know, in many cases, very, very strongly focused on the UX that goes around the delivery of that, uh, around the acquisition of, of, of similar customers that fall within that segment and, um, and, and sector. But when we think about the, uh, the B2B providers, um, you know, we have that perspective of looking across segments and sectors, which enables us to bring different lenses to the way that we can innovate. Uh, we also have um, strong visibility on the regulation uh, and the trends and aspects that are coming in there. Um, and, and I think that the sort of the mix of, of both of those is, is really where you get that sort of powerful hugely uh, potentially transformative partnership and that's really what uh, you know is exciting i think for, for for everybody on this panel is how you can bring the best of both worlds together how you can provide a great platform for that fintech that's trying to innovate um, great uptime real time next generation products around it in innovations from the, the b2b provider and equally facilitate you know, those great innovations and those great transformations and disruptions that the fintech is seeking to do as well. So for me, again, it goes back to how do we really make successful partnerships in this space, cement them, make sure that they're working and do away with those stats where, you know, 50 percent of, uh, of people feel that the partnership isn't optimal. So, you know, if, if we can really get that firing on all cylinders, then that's when the, the end customer will, will, will really benefit. Excellent. And, you know, speaking of that end customer, ultimately, you know, they're, they're the ones that need to be uh, serviced with the newest technology. Um, uh, but uh, do you think, Andy, that this is an, uh, an industry which has been driven by consumer demand? Or, or do you think it's uh, research and development teams just coming up with all these new ideas that no one knew that they needed or wanted and then just putting them in place? No, I mean, I... I... I, I think that you know, in, in, in innovation is is a change that that can make money is one of the definitions I've, I've heard of the word. So, you know, for for me, coming up with change for its own sake uh, and foisting it on a market, you know, through an R and D department, I, I, I think we see less and, and less and less of that. To be honest, um, uh, there, were, there were some stats that were uh, published recently by the World Bank that there. Are, there's 8 million underserved consumers in the UK and, and something like 24 million banks, uh, businesses, sorry, across Europe who are underserved. So there's a, there's a door that's, that's ajar there. There's a door that's, that's open. There's a door that is ready for uh, disruption, for people to come in with solutions um, and, uh, and help improve the, the, the offering. And that isn't going to come around by people sitting in an ivory tower and um, you know, sort of pontificating about what's going to work. It's about um, customer insights, customer research, being close to your end customers, working hand in glove with the regulators, working closely with the fintechs, and really looking to see about how you can, how and where you can, um, you know, transform and disrupt the market. Uh, and, and one of the sectors that we're focused on is, is uh, Contis is insurance, for example. And we believe there's a lot of um, friction um, in, in, in the insurance space in terms of payments. Uh, and we think that there's, there's some great areas that we could work together with the, the insurance uh, companies for the benefit of the end consumer, be it around payment disbursements for claims uh, and a whole host of other areas. So, again, I, I, I think that um, increasingly 
you know, the innovations have to be relevant and, 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 and can't be, you know, conjured up in isolation of, of the market realities. Sure. And, and kind of following on from that, Andres, could I get your perspective on this? As uh, Obviously, in Lithuania, you've got a very... Um young tech um, savvy population um, and that's got to help massively with for instance R&D but also demand. What have you seen in Lithuania when it comes to um, the public's uh, interest into getting these new financial products? Yeah uh, thanks for the question. So yeah it's kind of an interesting perspective uh, let it put it for a little bit uh, away of uh, the way we do the business in Mambo. Actually, what we do, we observe uh, uh, how uh, tech-driven companies are working, like, I don't know, you, you, Airbnb, Uber, and similar companies. What they actually do, they innovate a lot, they try a lot, they leverage ecosystems. And uh, actually, this is what we are trying to do and bring into the banking as a service business as well. So we are not facing the end customers, but what we do, we are enabling the financial organizations to serve their customers. And this is what our composable banking concept is all about. So it's about enabling the financial institutions to be ready uh, and flexible for change, uh, to do it in a fast manner, so they are adopting uh, the customer needs very fast. Uh, you know, nobody knows how the user experience uh, will look like in a year or two. So what we need to do in defining our businesses, we need to be uh, settled for the right architectures, right APIs, which you can compose in an offering which uh, customers needs in particular at that point in time. And actually this was one of the reasons why we uh, why Mambu has decided to bring uh, their footprint into Lithuania to utilize this young tech savvy communities and uh, knowledge which is here so they, we can bring more and more of this innovation, more and more of tech driven uh, mindset to the banking business. Interesting, brilliant. And um, we've discussed uh, you know, over the course of the panel you know, the difference really between uh, direct consumer fintechs compared to B2B fintech players. Um, but what I'm really interested in, in is how will that relationship change going into the future if uh, the B2B ones are just providing all the services. So I mean, Benjamin, could I please get your, your view on, on where do you think this, this ecosystem will go in the future? Thank you, Doug. Um, that's a great question. I think what we've seen a lot over the last few years and what we'll continue to see is quite a few of the direct-to-consumer um, fintechs pivoting to a business-to-business -business model because it's really tough getting a consumer proposition or, in, or a small business proposition or even a you know, large business proposition to market. Um, you know, Europe remains fairly fragmented, um, even if you're hugely successful in Poland equally successful in Czechia or Hungary or whatever is not easy. So many of the European direct-to-consumer uh, startups are struggling to scale beyond one country. There are some wonderful exceptions like N26 and Revolut, but it's tough. So I think you'll see more of those businesses pivoting, particularly where they've got a really strong technology platform or they've got capabilities that they can um, give to others. At the same time, you're going to see digital giants coming in. We're already seeing um, companies like Uber, like Apple and so on, playing a bigger role in financial services precisely because of banking as a service. Um, banking as a service companies are making it easier for an Amazon or whoever to start offering services direct to consumers. If you look at small business, it's happening even faster um, as you know accounting platforms like Sage or Xero and so on start integrating um, huge numbers of capabilities from other companies and building whole ecosystems. So I think you're likely to see a lot of the um, consumer focus and some of the small business focus fintechs shifting their business model, pivoting because they're finding it too hard to win um, business. Um, so you're going to see a growing number of B2B ones. Some of those will get acquired by existing businesses. So let's say someone like a Mambu is going to pick up a few other businesses that they see or where they've, there's great technology, great people, hasn't really got the scale. We're going to see a lot of consolidation 
on the, on the business to business financial software side as companies pick up smaller firms that are great tech, great people, but maybe struggling on the marketing side, struggling to really break through. So I think you'll see a lot of pivoting, a lot of consolidation over the next few years. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you uh, for that, that insight into the future. Um, and I think that's all we've really got time for for the um, original set of questions. And uh, time to take a, a Q&A um, look. I've been uh, getting a few throughout the um, throughout the, the panel. Um, unless anyone else has um, something they want to uh, jump in on at the end of at the end of that in terms of the future of this ecosystem. No, okay, perfect. Right, well, so um, I've got a number of questions here. Um, do you think with all this platformification and the barriers to entry being so much smaller that they're going to give way to a much more niche set of services? Will people end up having their main bank and their bank on the side? Would anyone like to jump in on that? And I'm not oh. afraid to... Uh, <laughs> I can I can start basically. I think you know the status quo today. What we have now, we have like several cards and several banks and several and probably several fintech companies that we have already on board. So I think that this plat platform platformification, as they call it, is probably shifting towards like one marketplace. You know where you can buy everything, like buy and obtain different kinds of services on one platform. WeChat is one of the examples that's already like for, for years now in Asia, right? So Amazon jumping on board, whether Facebook jumping on board with, with Libra and the other examples, I think that's a, that's a way forward. And of course, niche, uh, that's the gap where fintechs might actually fin fill in. And as we as we saw during this pandemics, right, uh, like many many fintechs would help and jump on board while helping to support the small uh, SMEs and uh, and, uh, and different different businesses with the federal aid. And uh, this was one of the examples how maybe banks were too slowly and fintechs jumped like on board. So I think that diversification and as diverse market we have uh, that helps to serve the, the right customer needs or the business needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And Andy, sorry, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, just to, yes. to, to add a couple of points to that. Um, I think that, uh, that obviously open banking is is predicated on, on this very thing. It's, it's how we can share data for, for the end consumer's benefit by enabling different products and services to, to be developed. But I think in terms of that true platformification, though, uh, a lot of it will come down to the ability of us to, to port our identity, our digital identity between different uh, entities as well. And I, I know there's been a lot of work uh, done around that, some more successful than others. But in terms of, of that area, I think that that will be really interesting. Um, and there was a, uh, there was a, a piece of work done by an investment company from the West Coast of, of America called Andreessen Horowitz recently that said all companies will become fintechs. I think that might be a little bit of a, a stretch and an overstatement, but you do see with um, whether it's Uber, uh, Airbnb, um, some of the mobile phone operators, uh, some of the insurance uh, companies that we work with, that wish to develop financial ecosystems, payment ecosystems. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, if we can get that identity aspect right and a safe porting of that identity between different companies, I think that uh, that, will, that will aid that um, increase in, in, in developments of, uh, of, of, of ecosystems. Excellent. And uh, that leads me actually on to my uh, next question. Um, if yeah, effectively every company is going to be a fintech company, um, does that ultimately mean that banking the unbanked will just become ir irrelevant because everyone will have to be connected um, to a bank in, in some way to use applications? Um, how, do you how do you see fintechs um, leading innovation here in, in helping people um, finally becoming banked? Andrew, should I get your Benjamin? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I can tell. 
So my perspective, you know, it's very simple here. What we can already observe is that many tech-driven companies already driving uh, the user behavior another way. Already today, we have many, many services and companies delivering everything on the mobile phone, let's say. We don't know how the experience will change further, but what we for sure know that uh, the user demand due to those facts which technology-driven company is giving to us and the way how we can enjoy other services suggest that banking services should adopt as well. And if the traditional banking, if the uh, old school banking will not be able to adopt or stay on par with these uh, tech-driven companies, definitely, uh, definitely they will not uh, stay for a long time. Right? So fintechs uh, are here and definitely here to stay. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And Benjamin, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, we, we spoke at the same time. Um, I was just going to say, we've seen distribution costs falling massively over the past couple of decades. And as a result of that, millions and millions of people around the world have been brought into payment systems for the first time. Um, that's going to continue to increase. But what's also happening is the ability to deliver better and better outcomes to customers through better customer experiences is continuing continuing to increase as companies develop better technologies, better solutions. I don't actually believe that every company will become a fintech, but what we will see is financial services being embedded into more and more things so that as we as consumers or businesses pursue particular outcomes, we have problems in our lives, companies are going to come up with creative, imaginative solutions that offer involve payments or lending or deposits um, that enable us to do things more easily. So what we're going to see is financial services becoming embedded into more and more other services so that we have to think about it less so it becomes easier for us. Um, Andy made a great point about insurance companies. You know, insurance companies really trying to think hard about What's the asset that, come, that, that someone's trying to insure? They're trying to look after their home. They're trying to look after their car. So we can see all sorts of other companies like utilities and telcos and so on partnering with insurance companies to make it easier for us as consumers to manage that asset. So what's interesting is if you're a traditionally minded bank or insurance company or wealth manager, you just don't see this change in mindset as leading companies think about the ultimate customer outcome and build new services around that. So there's a huge shift coming, and some people understand it because they're close to customers and thinking about customers, and some people are carrying on in the same old way and they don't quite see what's happening. Interesting. And uh, I mean, with that, going back to almost the first question from the, the uh, audience, um, and you brought it up um, slightly, Benjamin, talking about the tech providers. Um, do you think we're going to see um, them make more um, overt movements into financial services? Or do you think um, they're pretty much, for instance, with the Google card and the Apple card, that's as far as they're going to go? Andy, could I get your view on that, please? Yeah, it's um, it's going to be really interesting to watch, isn't it? We, it, it as you say, we've seen some steps. Um, uh, I, I think, given the customer data um, and, and and therefore the insights that they have around their their customers, I think they've been relatively modest steps thus far. Um, and I wonder whether uh, customers would feel that. Um, that maybe it would be a step too far for some of those companies that have a huge amount of data about them to to, to take on the mantle of being their their provider of of, 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 of financial services in terms of their banking needs. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that they could do you know a fantastic job driven by insights in terms of the products and services that would likely interest that individual based on the huge amount of, of insight that they have around the individual. But I think I, I just watched that one with a bit of, uh, of interest to see how far uh, an Amazon or a Google, um, Facebook, etc., might might take that um, and what the uh, consumer receptiveness might, might, might be to that. Interesting. And uh, we've got, oh, yes? I think they'll take it as far as they can. I think this is yeah. going to come down to a battle between the European Union regulators and the big tech giants. If you look at China, you look at what Alipay is, you look at WeBank and so on, they will keep 
adding more and more and more. Um, look at Goldman Sachs partnering with Apple. Goldman Sachs has got nothing to lose in the existing infrastructure. They're not an established bank in, they're not an established retail bank. They will power Apple as far as Apple wants to go. I think we're going to see a lot of digital giants pushing hard into financial services, and that's going to be a huge threat to established financial services companies. Well, that will be a really interesting um, change in the industry. And kind of, um, I've got another crystal ball question from uh, from the audience. Um, and um, Eric, if I could uh, point that your way, yeah, what do you think will be the most outstanding change in the financial industry from a customer's point of view in the next five years? As a hard one. <laughs> I think that's a tough question having in mind that like uh, a half a year ago we wouldn't think that COVID might happen at all and would change dramatically and shift dramatically the industry that that not only impacts the finance but the the general humanity. So I think the main thing that we might face is actually uh, user identification, the user onboarding process. So having these like cross platforms and different, uh, different stakeholders and uh, players on board, it's, uh, it's a really challenging thing to build a trust with the customer so that he would get the service using and so that he would verify himself. So I think the uh, customer's ID thing that's a uh, that's thing that would shift not only financial industry but uh, all of the industries as as follows which are dedicated to uh, our identification in general and like all of the fin uh, fintech and tech companies are are facing the challenge right at the moment and many providers are having many different types of data that they try to, with the, uh, with the empowerment of the AI, try to modify and analyze. However, I think the, the main challenge is how do you build a trust with the, with the customer so that he would have the right path uh, to onboard uh, to the service he might use. Interesting. And Andreas, do you think, uh, do you agree that it's going to be mainly um, a KYC issue going forward with all that data that all these companies will now have? You know, in some previous questions I have already mentioned, you know, the five years period is something uh, very big in tech world, you know, given the fact like everything is moving so rapidly, it's uh, so hard to predict. And I think it would be a good wrap up for our discussion if we uh, if we can tell that, you know, the only thing which uh, we are sure about that it will change and what uh, we have to take into the consideration is to prepare those for those changes, which are definitely coming, which means we need to have uh, flexible architectures so we can compose uh, uh, our future, whatever it comes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the only uh, constant is uh, change. And um, speaking about the, uh, we've got, you know, just a time for one more quick one, I think. Uh, the change in, uh, in data and identification, uh, Benjamin, you brought it up earlier, that the WeChats and over in China, that mm -hmm. significant amount of data that they, they can pull on their customers is so much more colorful than maybe in Europe and America. Does that mean that, for instance, we're going to see in China and Hong Kong far more interesting financial services uh, being and products being created than the rest of the world in the next five years? Not necessarily. I think there's a huge there's a, so much we can learn from China, but there's a big difference in in terms of the sort of information standards and privacy rights and so on. That it's a little bit of a lessons for Europe from China because that just aren't the same kind of protections that we have here. Um, I do think we'll see a lot of innovation coming out of China. I think the Chinese companies have been hugely innovative. Um, there's a, a vast amount to learn, but I'm not sure that we're going to follow the same path in Europe. But that didn't quite answer your question. Sorry, I missed the question. No, so the, the question was just uh, with the sheer amount of colourful data that the Chinese government and Chinese uh, fintech companies have, do you think there's a chance that Europe and America and Africa can never catch up when it comes to creating these brilliant new financial products that they might be able to create? No, I think we can, I think we can catch up. 
Excellent. All right, guys. Well, I think that's all we have time for on the panel. Thank you very much for attending with me, and it was really insightful um, for me. And um, I'd like to say uh, thank you to our audience and the questions, um, especially the tough one on, you know, for the next five years. Um, but uh, thank you very much. And to the panel, I mean, I don't suppose – have you got any other inputs for, the, um, for any question that I might have skated over? No, I don't believe so. Okay, excellent. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for uh, being on the the panel with me, and uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting you all outside of the uh, virtual yeah. uh, uh, digital uh, world that we live in. Mm -hmm.